On today's episode, we are finishing off this amazing concrete patio and installing a very strong pergola. If you want to know how to do it, keep on watching. Let it started. In my last video, I showed the entire process of building forms and pouring concrete quickly and easily for our concrete patio area. But it's been a week and it's now time to remove our concrete forms. The supportive steel stakes are extremely easy to remove just by removing the one screw in each one and then giving it a couple love taps to loosen it in place. Just another reason why I like these stakes so much compared to your standard wood ones is that they're so easy to remove even if they're encased in concrete. Once all of our stakes were removed, I then went around the entire perimeter removing any of the screws that I'm still able to get to. As you can see, these outer perimeter forms are very straightforward to remove, and the concrete itself did not stick to the 2x4s whatsoever without any type of prep to those 2x4s either. These are just your standard 2x4s coming straight from Home Depot, and no wax or release additive was applied to a prior. Once all the exterior forms were completely removed, I then grabbed a reciprocating saw and started cutting relief cuts into our forms. I've done this before on concrete pours, and by cutting our forms into smaller sections, it makes it much easier to remove, at least on past projects. And yes, I do know that numerous people in my previous video said there's no possible way this guy is going to get these forms out of here. Well, with these relief cuts, we still weren't able to, and I have something to say to all of you naysayers. Ah, well. You are right, because these forms are extremely difficult to get out, and I pride myself on always showing you, the audience, the right way to do things. Unfortunately, in this circumstance, I've done this in the past on a much smaller slab, and they were easily able to come out with a jack. Unfortunately, on this one, they are not so easy to get out. But the good news is, is that I was able to figure out a way to get myself out of this situation with a standard seven and a quarter inch circle saw, but I also need a 10 and a quarter inch circular saw. I'll show you how it's done. And hopefully next time, if you're doing this, just put a quarter inch shim in between these two boards and you'll save yourself a lot of time and energy. The problem is not that the concrete is sticking to our two by fours. The problem is that there's weight on both sides of our two by fours that are pushing our boards together. That means there's a significant squeeze point in between these two boards, which is making it near impossible to remove. By running a blade down the center between these two boards will make a nice relief cut, and that small blade width is exactly what we need to release the pressure between these two boards. I took approximately three to four passes with my seven and a quarter inch blade. That way the blade was able to run more smoothly every single pass versus trying to do it all at once. Once I had that taken care of and went as deep as possible, that's when I grabbed the 10 and a quarter inch blade, which goes down all the way to three and a half inches, which is exactly the depth that we need. This is a Mondo circular saw that I don't want to jam up, so I did go quite slowly through this entire pass. But once you were through, you were easily able to remove every single board between our two concrete pavers. Almost comically, this is all that I needed to remove these boards extremely quickly and easily. Literally a blade width is all you need, which is why hopefully if you do this on your projects, just grab a couple shims and shim it out slightly between each board. That way those shims can easily be removed after the pour is complete. I literally spent all day removing these forms, which should have taken a mere hour or two to do. So please keep that on mind on your project because I want to make sure that you learn from my mistake, not replicate it. Once all of our forms were completely removed, we can now move on to filling. For filling, we're using a very small pea gravel, which is a very nice complement to this entire space and works out perfectly well for drainage. And that's really a nice way to complement this area because not only do we have a beautiful modern look, but you also have built in drainage over the entire area of the patio. Product like this can be easily picked up at a large bulk yard, which is very nice, especially if you have a truck already because they'll dump it right into the back of your bed. 
All you need to do is wheelbarrow it in place from your truck to the patio and spread it out accordingly. And I do make sure I'm spreading out around the perimeter of our patio as well to give it a nice finished look over the entire area. I'm just gonna have to obviously hose this entire area down after all the rock is applied, since our concrete is already getting quite dirty. And speaking of dirt, the one area where I actually do apply dirt is where our grass is meeting the edge of our patio. The lawn actually naturally goes up a couple inches in elevation just a few feet away from our patio, which means it's a perfect opportunity to just add some soil to the area, tamp it down nicely, and we'll eventually spread some grass seed on it. I could show you quite a nice transformation at this point, however, I feel like this area just needs a little bit something extra. These are vertical posts for a pergola. Now we've actually installed a gazebo in the same exact backyard last year, but this is from Sunjoy and we're gonna be installing a pergola right in our new beautiful modern patio area. So let's get to assembly. One of the best things about this pergola is the fact that it's so easy to install. Literally only two different screws come with this entire kit system, one being one inch and the other one being an inch and a half long. The first step of this installation is to install our base plates to our posts. There are four posts and each post gets a base plate that is attached with four screws, one on each side of course. Once all four of our base plates are installed, we can move on to our post tails. Now these post tails are actually installed at the very top of each post, and these simply and quickly install via four screws, two on two different sides. Every single fastener that you've seen is the shorter screw that comes with the kit, and in all honesty, I don't even touch the longer screws till the very end when I'm installing the top beams overhead. This pergola footprint is 12 feet by 10 feet, and no, this does not come in a 12 foot long package, which is why we actually have to assemble our cross beams together. There's a powder coated black connection plate that is inserted into our cross beam and then screwed directly into the plate. You might have to give it a little bit of a wiggle in order for the channel to fit snugly in place, but eventually it will fit in very nicely and all you have to do is secure a couple screws in the very top. This is a 10 foot by 12 foot pergola, which means that there are multiple sizes for these cross beam connections. Luckily for us, all parts are labeled very nicely and it's easy to figure out which parts need to go where, but in this application, just remember that B goes into D that goes into C and E goes into G that goes into F. So those are the two different versions that we're making pairs of. And once all those are fully assembled, it's time to actually get this thing stood up. I lay down two of our vertical posts right on our concrete patio and insert our very first cross beam connection. I secure this connection down with two screws and then move my way down to the opposite side. Keep in mind that this is a faux print on aluminum and it can be scratched. I feel like it is very durable, but in order to make sure that I'm not scratching it the moment I get it, I place some two x fours on the concrete in order to avoid any scratches along the way. As you can see here, you can easily assemble these sections together by yourself and actually maneuver it in place if you shimmy one side and then move to the other and then move to the other until it's in the exact position that you want. However, it is a lot easier to move and install with a second hand. So if you're able to, make sure you grab a helping hand if possible, just to get this next section up because it is much easier with two than one. Now that we have all of our vertical posts standing up, we can grab our second set of cross beam connections and connect those pieces to our post tails. And this might need a little bit of a shimmy one way or the other, just to make sure that it sits in that channel nicely. But once you have it in place, you're easily able to secure it with a few screws. We do the same exact procedure to the opposite side, making sure that our cross beam is slid into place on one side and then maneuver our final end into our post tail. Once that's taken care of, fasten it down and we can move on to our next assembly part. These next brackets are called mid cross beams and these really stiffen up the entire structure very nicely. Just as our previous longer beam connections, there are also three parts involved with this installation as well. M goes into L goes into N, and that's how this entire system is put together. The only thing is about this one is that there are multiple fastening hole locations as you see here, but there's only two needed. 
You'll see why when we get to our overhead beams, but before then, we need to get this fastened to our cross beams that we installed previously. You actually have to back out four screws at the center point, then squeeze our middle cross beam into place and fasten it down appropriately. Once I have one side fully secured, I then go to the opposite side and do the same exact thing. With one middle cross beam connector fully installed, I then assemble the other two members and get those fully installed as well. These brackets not only strengthen the entire system, but it's also where our purlins are going to be attached to. Before we get to that final step, I do double check for levelness on all four corners just to make sure that this entire system is looking good and doesn't need any major adjustments. There were a few slight ones, but all in all, we were exactly where we wanted, and now we can move on to purlins, or lattice, or however else you want to pronounce these things. But these are going to be going directly on top of our pergola, and these provide not only beauty, but it also stiffens up the entire pergola above because we're attaching them to all of our center supports, which those those fasteners then stiffen up the rest of the structure. It's now finally time to use our secondary and longer screw set at this application and this is the only area where we're using our longer screws because we need to go through these purlins into the frame below. Each row of purlins only requires three screws because there are only three center supports. Plus there's a U-style clip system that goes in the dead center support which secures both purlins in the same row together. With that said, I want to say a huge and special thank you to Sunjoy, the sponsor of this week's video. The BYOT audience came through for them last year because there were plenty of gazebos purchased, but this year they wanted to show off a pergola, and I thought this concrete patio project was a perfect opportunity to showcase the beauty of their pergola. This thing was truly a breeze to install, and if you want 13% off your next purchase, then type in BYOT at checkout, and the link is in the description box below. I truly love how this entire area turned out, from the patio to the rocks to the absolutely beautiful and perfectly placed pergola, I must say this is truly one beautiful, sexy beast of a transformation. From what it was before to what it is now is quite remarkable and such an inviting space for a growing family. And as you can see, a lot has changed since a year ago. What a cute sexy beast. Oh yeah. <laughs>